So I think brands have to actually go one step further. They just can't be authentic anymore. They, and, but they can't get offline either right. because there's, there's no putting that genie back in the bottle. Um, so and I'm looking at, they have to do something that's going to shake up the marketplace. Dark social is basically when a brand engages consumers or prospects in less public digital forums, like, like messenger. Everybody, welcome back to a, another, I saw that, no, you episode didn't. of Marketing <laughs> on Tap. This is my mate, Danny Brown. My name is Sam Fiorella. Danny, today, um, I'm actually really excited about this topic because it's something that's been going on quite a bit uh, in uh, conversations internally. But I was reading, um, as I typically do, at the train in the morning. And this morning, I found an article um, about Edelman's 2018 Trust Barometer. Okay. And they indicated that 60% of people that they surveyed as part of their trust barometer no longer trust social media companies, which I thought was really kind of interesting because you know, we've been talking about this a lot internally about the fake news uh, that's being reported, uh, fake influencers that you know we're talking a lot about and how that's affecting the perception of the messages that we put out there on behalf of our brands. Right. And that's something that I think uh, I know we struggle with is how are we going to be credible in a world where, you know, Facebook is not trusted anymore <laughs> because of everything that's going yeah. on there. Like there's just so much negativity and fake information out there, um, fake, you know, with the bots and everything mm -hmm. that there's a real challenge right now for businesses. So I thought today we can sort of talk a little bit about how a brand can earn that authenticity and what they need to do to fight some of yeah. that. So I think okay. it's kind of an interesting right. topic yeah, today. It'll be very informative anyway. Um, but as always, the most, well, not the most well, important. The, yes, the it's the most important <laughs> thing is the beer, beer uh, that we're drinking. What are we drinking yeah, today? Yeah, so we're revisiting our friends at Collingwood. Collingwood, like uh, these guys. We've not had a bad beer from these guys yet, yeah. I think, right? This is one of their uh, seasonal ones. It's a uh, Whitney's Vintage Ale. And it's a fall beer, fall city winter. And it's based on the original uh, brewing tradition begun by Richard Whitney, who's the master brewer of the original Collingwood Brewery back in 1860. Oh, cool. So it's got same Georgian Bay water. It's got a lot of harvested gold honey and a lot of wet hops in there after fermentation. So, yeah, Rob's not going to like this one. Okay, so it's a 6.9% ABV. Uh, IBUs, uh, mixer. That's about four, 35 IBU. Oh, so I can, I can drive home after this. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so we'll see what it's like. All can right, guys, let's try on? this. I'm going to get the Robert Cam. Hang on. We need to see... Uh, and everybody needs to see Robert's reaction to this. Oh, just a smell. There we go. I know. I can tell by the smell that uh, already Robert doesn't matter the taste. All right, guys. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, everyone. Yeah, that's another good beer from Collingwood, I think. It's funny because the taste is so opposite what I'm what smelling. You're yeah, exactly. Unlike the last couple of ones that well, we it's, tried. Um, it's, all, it's got a lot of wet hops from uh, from uh, Meaford, so big head hops in Meaford. Yeah. It's got a lot of them wet hop it, so it just brings that flavor out. So it's very different from a, from a more hoppy beer, for example. It, this actually reminds me of a West Coast IPA almost. It's got that's mm, a similar yeah. kind of a taste. Anyway, um, I will enjoy this one. And as, uh, as as is usually the case, I'm also going to be enjoying Robert's class <laughs> after this. Um, okay, so uh, let's get back to this. Um, I got the article up here, Danny. Um, so it says, uh, against the backdrop of fake news and data manipulation, users have grown distrustful of influencers, both celebrity and media personalities. In a major reversal, trust has reverted back to immediate friends, family, and close acquaintances on social media, individuals whose personal credibility speaks more than the size of their following. Right. That sounds like something people read about in a book five, five years, years ago. Five years ago. I know, right? <laughs> about the small circles of influence and how that, you know, actually well, impacts <laughs> out. Well, that's why I, that's what, like, I mean, I was on the train this morning reading. I go, wait, what? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like this is, we were talking about this when it comes to influence marketing mm -hmm. five years ago, that it's not about your audience size. It's about one-to-one um, -one dyadic relationships, yeah. which I think was a chapter seven in the book or I something like so, that. Yeah. Uh, dyadic relationships where, um, and, and those of you, the, any of my students, former students that are listening to this, you should know what I'm talking about. 
uh, the, the power of dyads, right? And my big keynote presentation on influence marketing right now is that the internet is too big for influence marketing. Yeah. It's just too big. There's too many people. There's too much fake uh, programs out there, too many fake influencers that the power of one-to-one relationships and that authenticity that comes in one-to-one friendships and engagements actually drives more influence over a purchase decision right. than that. So this really opens up, I think, the door for what's coming in 2019 and beyond. There's a shift happening and they're calling it, you know, real is back. Okay. And that it isn't about what we're, you know, they say that even if you're a garage business or business operating out of your garage, you can operate like, yeah, like totally. IBM because mm-hmm. no one is going to know that you're working out of your garage. You can put any front on that you want. But because so many people have done that, there's so much distrust, as you know, Edelman's uh, trust barometer here shows, that we now need to go the other way. So what advice in general, we can get into, into some yeah, specifics, yeah. but in general, what kind of advice can we give people you know, to what can they do as a brand or as a marketer for a brand to establish that trust again in the face of all of this online distrust? Yeah, well, I think they've got to be honest with themselves and their their audience that they're trying to attract, and you know, and the influencers they're working with, and say, okay, we know it's for sales, etc. We know we're trying to shift product, but let's give value to the customers we're trying to attract first, and then the sales hopefully will come. So if it's about you know education advice about the product, um, you know why it's different, why a certain battery is different from you know whatever, mm-hmm. um, it, it's the content you're putting out is it has to be you know natural and not salesy and not just you know thrown to a, a guy with a hundred thousand followers to shove out to their audience in the hope that it's going to sell some stuff. Yeah, you know what? That, to me, that just sounds like. It's important to be authentic, but we've been saying that it's important to be authentic <laughs> since listening. And yeah, no, clearly yeah. nobody listened. Uh, you know, since the early two thousands when we got involved in the internet and social media. Why is it today? They're not. They're going to listen to us. Any, well, any old marketers like us are going <laughs> to listen to us and say, "God, we've been talking about authenticity forever." That, it's got to be more than that. People have to break something. You yeah. know what I mean? Like they, they really have to shake it up as a brand. I think to gain that trust. Um, I, I know Adidas did a campaign. Uh, was it last year? I believe it was, where they said we. I think their exact words were, "We need to shake things up from our boring traditional media buy and, and advertising." Because Adidas is known as a as a brand that's quality but not very sexy. Right. When you they, they, it to a Nike, to a, like a Nike, yeah. right? So I know one of the things they did after the World Cup uh, was uh, there will be haters, and I think that was the hashtag. Okay. In fact, and they created all these videos of basically soccer fans, you know, football fans for proper football fans, uh, soccer for North Americans, um, so, uh, soccer players that everybody hated on, like a Luis Suarez. Right, yeah, and yeah. they actually have, I don't care, say what you want, hate me all you want, right. you know what I mean? But look at all of my trophies, look at all of my accolades, I'm still the best player in the world or, or whatever the campaign was. But basically they were trying to say, oh, you know, shock you, make you pay attention to cut through the clutter. So I think brands have to actually go one step further. They just can't be authentic anymore. They and, but they can't get offline either right. because there's there's no putting that genie back in the bottle. Um, so and I'm looking at they have to do something that's going to shake up the marketplace. So that might actually be doing uh, ask and ask me anything with the uh, the president. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what I mean. I think uh, the Domino's example that we gave a little while ago, when yeah. you know Domino's was dying and they found you know rats in their tomato sauce and you know all that kind of <laughs> crazy <laughs> stuff. Employees. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, and one of the things he did is he went out there, he apologized to himself, mm-hmm. to himself. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, like Sam's had enough. Like yeah. cut. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> give me yours. Uh, clearly, I haven't had enough. I think that's the problem. Well, he apologized to everybody, like, and it was a heartfelt apology, yeah. and he answered questions. You know but I mean? doesn't I think that come that's back to part being of it. authentic? You were saying we have to go beyond authentic. He was authentic, yeah. but that was about eight years ago. So yeah, that was so that was authentic <laughs> back then. Yeah, no, but I mean for, saying, yeah. that was like different from back then because no other brand, frankly, had the kahunas right. to have their CEO stand up there and answer questions. Right? Take a look at what's happening with Zuckerberg. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. he's the exact opposite. He gets in front of Congress and is like he's a robot. Yeah, you know what right. I mean? Like there is no authentic. He just made the case worse for himself. So. I don't even know what it is today, but something has to happen. 
I wonder then if, I know we've spoken before about brands shouldn't go off message too much unless you're like a Wendy's and they roast everybody on Twitter yeah. and they, they enjoy that. I, I love their Twitter account. That's amazing. Yeah, Wendy's and there's another one I can't quite remind offhand. But I'm wondering now if part of that is actually brands really just saying, this is why we're different because the other brand sucks. Yeah. And maybe just be honest about why that brand sucks versus this one. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know if that's going too far off the... I'm wondering if it isn't going... To go to the earlier point, maybe instead of us think, definitely you got to think creatively, you got to think, you got to really shock the system. But maybe if you're not going to go that route, because that takes a lot of courage yeah. and it takes a lot of risk as well, because it could also backfire on you really easily. I know one of the trends right now is to go into the dark uh, web, mm -hmm. not dark web, dark, dark social, social. Yeah. excuse me, dark social. Um, and so for those of you that don't, don't know, dark social is basically when a brand engages consumers or prospects in less public digital forums like like Messenger, you know what I mean? Or Kick. Um, even Snapchat. Or like even that. Snapchat where you're actually talking directly. These are not, so in that case, it's like ask as an, from an influencer marketing perspective, send this recommendation to 50 of your friends or, you know, or, or followers on Facebook Messenger. Well, the world doesn't see that. Right, it's yeah. not posted publicly, so the number of followers you have is irrelevant. The problem, just to sort of finish off that little section, the problem with dark social is that it's difficult to track. Yeah. So one of the reasons why a lot of marketers don't do that, because so many marketers hold themselves accountable to how many views and how many shares and how many likes, yeah. vanity metrics, that you can't do that in those in the dark social type application. So it becomes a challenge. But I know, for example, um, uh, who is it that does this? Uh, Sephora. Sephora does a fantastic job. They've got a, a kick program. That's on. a fashion brand, right? It's Sephora? a fashion yeah. brand, Sephora. Yeah, it's a, I got a 16-year-old daughter. I know <laughs> everything there is to know yeah. about Sephora. She has an account there. They know her on for, by a first name basis. Um, but I know one of the things, and this is how I learned about this, what Sephora does is if you have any kind of makeup request or tip, you could actually message Sephora on Kick, and you'll get tutorials. All right, like okay. it's it's an it's an it's auto bot. Yeah, it's not an actual human being. It's a bot, but they're they're communicating with you contextually. Uh, they can recognize recognize what it is that you're asking. They'll answer a question and then give you tutorials, All right. so you can watch it. So that's a great um, two way conversation. Getting back to the issue of one to one. Right. You're yeah. building those personal relationships with an individual customer, a big brand, brand ambassadors, right? right? And you're developing brand ambassadors yeah. in the meantime, right? Uh, another example, going back to Adidas, uh, I read this one not that long ago. What Adidas has been doing for three years, very quietly, um, when it comes to uh, the dark social game, is they have been building communities of these um uh, soccer players that aren't yet professional, that still haven't made it into like the Premier League and thing, stuff, yeah. like younger yeah. kids, basically, and getting them to show off their skills. So, you know, record a video of yourself dribbling or taking that penalty kick or, you know, taking a spot kick and then post it into the community. The problem, of course, that they had is that all, they were trying to get major cities and they, they had like hundreds of kids that they were basically communicating with through Messenger and these in-house in communities, gated communities that wasn't available to the public. Right. They weren't trying to promote Adidas to the world. They were trying to promote Adidas to this just one level down but, soccer player, a kid. Which is smart. Cause that's the next generation of superstar. That's the next right. generation of superstar. Yeah. But, you know, of course, one of the problems is they couldn't handle the volume. So they went from having hundreds of people in each one of these cities to about 35, 36, 37 in each one of them. Right. And it was a little bit easier to now engage them. And they've actually shifted. Originally, it was about engaging them to sell products and to maybe help them identify who the next superstar is so they know who to sponsor. Right. Yeah. So they can find out early on by building that relationship with them. When So when a Nike goes to them with a sponsorship or Puma, these guys them. already have a relationship with them and they're more likely to take Adidas. Brilliant. Yeah, really good. Now what they're doing is this has become their influencer marketing campaign. Now what they're saying is, they got a mobile app, so now it's a little bit more automated, and it's about connecting each with each other. Right. They allow these, you know, they says we don't care if these guys never become superstars because they're influencers. Yeah. They're still soccer fans. They still they grew up in this soccer world, so it's a brilliant way to do it. So this might be one example for everybody about you know how to use dark social to build your authenticity. Um, 
But let, uh, how about a, a different type of a brand? Those are, are two different ones. Uh, I really want to get the idea. Well, actually, no, let me let me shift gears. I want to ask you. One of the things we get challenged with all the time is measuring our success. Right. Yeah. If dark social is not tra- not as trackable because you can't publicly see the shares, the likes, the comments that people make in these private networks, like a messenger, a Facebook messenger. How do how do you sell this concept to a brand that's looking for that measurement? Well, I think if you think of your own business, let's say you're a business that makes products. You have a research department that tests and everything before it goes to market and public and production and all that kind of stuff. So for me, Dark Social is a research department. And they're you know, finding out what works, what doesn't work, who's good, who's not good, who can you know, plan out a message, who can't plan out a message. Once you've got these guys, you mentioned that they're now influencers that are in the public, you can still track the public posts. Mm. So the guys that you've got in the program of Dark Social you're now sending out into the world with various tracking yeah. codes, you know, landing pages, et cetera, set up standard marketing stuff. You can track the success of, okay, let's say you have two groups within dark social, one uh, headed up by marketer A, one headed up by marketer B with message A and message B. Now you can start to test which ones work based on mm. the messaging, the training that they got, the education they got, and how they took that message out to the public and the results that you can publicly track right. back to these dark social areas. Right. That's interesting because I, I think that, um, huh, you know, what, what I, I'm look I'm listening to, to, to you say that. And one of the things you just said was, you know, just stand. Can you be speaking English again? Like last well, week. no, I mean, I think we've given up <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> asking you to speak English. Um, but you said uh, what I understood anyway of what you said uh, was yeah, this is just standard stuff. But it amazes me that it isn't just standard stuff. Like the idea of putting in a tracking code, something as simple as a tracking code into a messenger's request or an influencer's request. Right. You know what I mean? And and having all of your different, you know, influencers using a, a, a different um, a short code mm-hmm. or, or, you know, for a, a mobile app or a different um, a pearl, you know, for a, a viral campaign on the web just goes beyond most people. A lot of the clients that we talk to, their agencies just never did this for them. Right. And it's just so simple. But I agree with you. If you're going to do, if you're going to build these in-house communities, uh, like we do for some of our clients, some of the mm-hmm. communities, yep. the gated communities that we've built. I know one of the things that we do for, for those of you listening is say, okay, guys, we want to give you this message. Uh, we want you to share this message but there's going to be some type of a call to action. It doesn't have to be a call to action to go buy something, but something that we can then, uh, some call to action that their followers can pick up on and then run with, whether it's implicit, you know, or just subtle, then we can track what action happens beyond that. So we can see, are these conversations going out beyond our gated community, which is where that, that trust is. Um, But I, I still, I want to come back to this. I'm getting the signal that our time is up for this, for this uh, webinar, but, uh, so where's our bell? Here's our bell. Last Thanks, call. Steven. Thank you for the bell, Stephen. Um, the um, well, you know what? No, I'm gonna pass it to you first. So, what's the one again in English, if possible? <laughs> what is the one? Says the Italian. <laughs> I could, you know, no, I'm not even gonna try talking Italian <laughs> after a beer. Um, what is the, uh, the the one takeaway uh, from this conversation that people should write down, think about tomorrow when they get to the office? Um, I, I think it's like you said earlier, um, and it's a horrible phrase. I hate it with all my breath, if you like, but thinking outside the box, you know, what can you actually uh, do yeah. differently? We, we know that you have to be authentic. You, you know, you have to be personable on social, all that crap. And that's, that's not going to change, no. but just think of different ways from what you're doing now, uh, to actually, you know, connect and get a message out. And it, it may be that you have a dark social area to really, you know, ideate and just state plans and yeah. ideas without having to get, you know, crapped on in public because you had a really poor yeah, I think I think we got to redefine uh, authentic yeah um, authentic yeah. is not just being responsive it's not just you know lifting up the hood and letting people see how things operate in how like showing a video of your plant or how a product is made uh, you know McDonald's does the you know wh- where is this food from ask us anything you yeah know, McDonald's in Canada anyway. that's right yeah so I mean like those are some good examples but you have to go so much further mm-hmm. I do believe that you have to allow people inside um, I know we do something with one of our clients where we invite people to come into the the, the uh, 
our client's corporate head office. We take them on a tour of the plant. They can ask anything they want. We take them into super secret areas. They can ask whatever they want. They can get demos of whatever they want. Mm -hmm. And then they're free to share once they leave whatever they want. Yeah. That, you know, that one-to-one -one engagement, I think, is the thing. Okay. But for my last call for me, I want to go back to the concept of dyadic relationships. I think that's the one thing that people should take away from here is stop immediately jumping to, okay, what are we going to do that's big on the web? What are we going to do that's going to be seen by 50,000 or 100,000 or 500,000 or millions of people on Facebook? Right. Right. And I think it has to be, let's look inward. Let's create a community where... We don't care that you have 50,000 people and you're going to share it to 50,000 people. What we want is 500 of your followers yeah. that are actually potential customers of ours yeah. or that are actually potential users of our product that we can then engage to learn from and nurture along the path. And, right. along the path. and then maybe they become influencers, mm -hmm. you know, but if nothing else, these are people who might actually buy. Focus your money on people who might actually buy, not just on that vast audience of maybe Right. right. And and I think maybe that will help combat some of this mistrust or, or, or mistrust. That's distrust. the word. Distrust. 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 Mistrust. Non-trust. Lack who, of trust. Now right. who's not speaking English? <laughs> um, you know, the, the, this lack of trust. There we go. <laughs> this lack of trust that, you know, fake news has really put that in, of course, all of the uh, stupidity that's going on no, at, the bots uh, and everything at, at, as well. the, at Facebook and, yeah. you know, at Cambridge Analytica. And all. There really is that big distrust. So to fight that, stop. Don't even go there. Yeah. Go somewhere completely different. Create those communities. Anyway, that's, that's my thought for the day. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. For those of you listening and for those of you watching, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And if you're watching on video, make sure you hit the little notification button, subscribe, ding, ding, ding. comment, like, all the kind of things that happen on YouTube. That's it, guys. Cheers from uh, Robert uh, on the other side, Danny and me, guys. Cheers. Salute. Cheers, guys.